Um, so first of all, today, there was a Nobel Prize announced. Very exciting. Optics. We we'll talk about optics today. There's a the pointer. Yes, optical tweezers, which are uh, a lot of people here use. I know that Prof. Gurbodi at, at Harvey Mudd uses that, and uh, amplifying these ultra short pulses uh, was won by by these two. I actually looked up the paper this morning. It's it's amazing. It is three pages long and is incredibly clear. And it's rare that you see papers like that today. So it's definitely worth checking out. Um, let me let me just jump right in and say the problems that I'm addressing today are are not classical light applications, but asking about the quantum mechanical nature of light and the nature of quantum mechanics. So we have probably seen pictures like this, or even in your lab classes, experience pictures like this, we know that light comes in little discrete particles. If you have an extremely sensitive photo detector, and you turn down the amplitude of your, of your light source, uh, what you'll see is, as time goes by, little pulses of light. Little pulses of light. And, and from this, uh, it's clearer today than it was over 100 years ago, but uh, it's clear that light comes in individual discrete packets called photons. And I want to explore what, what photons are and how they, how they act and, uh, and what, what their properties are. So but first of all, who can tell me why, why are these pulses negative? Why are photons, why do photons make negative pulses in a photomultiplier tube? So what, what happens when the photon hits a piece of metal? What, what comes out? Electrons. And what are the charge of electrons? Negative. So here you're measuring a voltage. And when a whole bunch of electrons come out, they, they make negative charges and make a negative voltage. Great. All right, so you're, you're awake. Um, the thing that I want to focus on is not the quantum mechanics of things like the arrival time of photons or the energy of photons, but the quantum mechanics of the polarization of photons. So let me do a little demonstration here. I have my, my polarized sunglasses. I don't know how many of you have sunglasses that are polarized, but for the extra few dollars on eBay, you can get uh, sunglasses that allow you to have this whole sixth sense where light that's reflected at some angle is slightly polarized and, and the intensity changes. And I'll show you the light from my laptop, although probably it's not easy to do it on the projector. The light from my laptop is also polarized. So a lot of, let me tilt it a little bit. A lot of light gets through when I have the sunglasses horizontal, not all of it, because there's still darkened horizontal, there's still darkened sunglasses. But as I rotate the sunglasses, these particular polarized sunglasses block almost all the light. And the reason why they make sunglasses like this is because reflections off of water or off of the road or off of cars uh, can be polarized. And it would be better to block those uh, reflections of the sun in your eyes, but keep as much of the actual things you want to see as possible. So this is why they make sunglasses polarized. I have some 3D glasses here, which are also polarized. Um, if you hold them certain ways, they, they act slightly differently. But these are... These are pretty good. These are even better polarizers because they, they block less of the light. So when, when, they're, oops, when, they are, uh, when they're aligned vertically like this, they let a lot of light through. And when they're aligned horizontally, they block almost all of the light. Do I have this right? Yeah. 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 So, so um, you can buy some pretty good polarizers, both kind of the plastic sunglassy type, but also there's these polarizing beam Splitters, where if you send in uh, vertically polarized light, it reflects off of this interface here. And if you send in horizontally polarized light, it goes through. And you can buy these that are, and they're incredibly efficient. So something like 99.9% .9 of the horizontally polarized light gets through, and something like 99 point something percent of the vertically polarized light gets reflected. And so if you held it up to the laptop, it would all go through, I think. Uh, and so we can examine what, what happens when, when we put in light that's not exactly horizontal, exactly horizontal or exactly vertical. What happens when we put in light that's at 45 degrees? Well, we know that light comes in these discrete packets. And so we know that uh, once, once a single photon of light goes through, we're not going to get a pulse that's half as high. That would violate the 
the fact that every photon comes with, every photon of the same color at least comes with the same amount of energy, we get a pulse of the same height. What happens is the photon either goes through or it gets reflected. And quantum mechanics, or at least the aspect of quantum mechanics that covers the polarization of light, is all about what is the probability of this happening or that happening or the other happening. So if you put in light at 45 degrees, half of it goes through, half of it acts like it's horizontally polarized, half of it reflects, half of it acts like it's vertically polarized. And there's a couple different ways of thinking about that, but um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So, so what if we put in light that's not at 45 degrees, where half gets through and half reflects? So this is the, the transmission probability, the probability that light will go through. If we turn this thing slowly around, if we rotate the, the cube, um, we start out with pure horizontal light, 100% of it will go through. When we rotate this cube over some angle, we increase the angle, less and less and less, and less light will get through. At 45 degrees, exactly half of it will get through and half of it will reflect. Keep rotating, and at 90 degrees, all of it will reflect, and none of it will go through. So, the well, big question of quantum mechanics is how do we understand this? How do we understand this curve? Where does this come from? And there are different models that people came up with to kind of visualize where these probabilities come from. And in one of the early models, and, and maybe something if you first encounter quantum mechanics, something that's kind of in the back of your mind, or based on what I just said, something that's in the back of your mind. So, photon approaches this thing. And it, it comes with a polarization angle. So maybe it's created with a, from a laptop tilted at 45 degrees. It comes with a polarization angle. It hits this interface, and it looks up on this table and says, OK, at 45 degrees, I, I should flip a coin, flip a fair coin, and go through half the time and reflect half the time. And I'll make a decision locally at this interface to, to determine what happens. And, and uh, the, the decision is happening. Um, at, at the place where the splitting happens. And this local, and maybe what happens here is incredibly complicated, and we, we don't really know what's going on, but the mathematics and quantum mechanics is, gives us an incredibly accurate prediction of what's going on. But one model is that what's happening here is local. It hits this thing and somehow decides what, what probability it should, it should take to go through. But that, oh, that's exactly what I said. That actually can't, can't be the case. That does not fully describe all the experiments that we can do in quantum mechanics. And there's a long history here. So these, this trio, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, all the way back in 1935, pointed out that this model, which sort of people maybe had in the back of their head, can't, can't be the right model for what's going on in the world of quantum mechanics. Something, something more is happening. And here's a modern version of, of their argument. So there are certain crystals that you can get, and this is called BBO, beta barium borate crystal. Um, they're, they're special crystals where if you shine a really bright ultraviolet laser into them, occasionally, very rarely, maybe one in every 10 to the 12 photons, uh, one in every 10 to the 12 high, high energy ultraviolet photons will turn into a pair of infrared photons. So energy is conserved, that's not a problem. But if you take the pair from exactly the right spot, this pair of photons behaves in a very peculiar way. It behaves uh, in, in a way that has come to be known as quantum entanglement. That's what I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about. So what does that mean? At least in this, this example, what, what, what comes out, if there are two infrared photons coming out, you can measure them each with their own beam splitter. And what comes out, if you have both beam splitters oriented horizontally, vertically, you haven't rotated them. Either both of the photons will go through the beam splitter, or both of the photons will reflect. It's never the case that one goes through and one reflects. At least if your experiments are, are really good, you buy the super expensive beam splitters, you can minimize the probability that, that different things happen. And what's amazing about this, that took a while for people to really fully digest, is that actually it doesn't matter how you orient them. No matter how you orient these beam splitters, as long as they're oriented together, it's always the case that either both go through and continue on, or both reflect. And if you think about the model I gave before, where each photon has its own polarization, and it, it's walking or doing whatever photons do toward the beam splitter, and it hits the interface, and it decides, should I go through or should I reflect, based on the flip of some coin, 
But you're never going to get this effect. You're never going to get the effect where no matter how you rotate the polarizers, always the same thing happens. Right? So uh, before, if you can imagine this, this thing sending out a pair of horizontal photons, and sure, they would always go through horizontally. And then if you rotated the beam, the view splitters, you rotated these polarizers, rotated the sunglasses, um, then, then things would start happening, happening, happening uh, probabilistically at, at this, at this uh, measurement. And, and because you can find systems like this, where no matter how you orient both of the detectors, the same thing happens. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen argued that this model of local measurements, local probabilities, the photons traveling and hitting this beam splitter and then deciding probabilistically based on, based on how things were oriented, whether to go through or whether to reflect, that couldn't be the case. Somehow they have to be coordinated. Somehow they have to know about each other. And this famously, uh, Einstein later described it famously as being spooky action at a distance. But there's really no action at a distance. I'll, I'll show you what there is at a distance. It's still very impressive. Uh, but so, how, how crazy is this? Well, uh, at, at Harvey Mudd, we have one of these crystals. We, we do this experiment in the lab. I don't know if you have one at Pomona for your advanced lab or something. You can create entangled photons. We're actually collaborating with you to get our setup running. Oh, all right. So <laughs> one, one day you, you will. Uh, and, and here's sort of looking down the beam at UV laser going through this, um, these, these optics here. Uh, through some other optics. This is the, the crystal. It's, it's about, I don't know, five millimeters square. And, uh, and out, of, out of here, mostly just ultraviolet light comes, but occasionally two infrared photons come. And one goes slightly that way, and one goes slightly that way. And then we can measure the polarization. We can do this experiment. And yes, quantum mechanics gives the correct description, but is inconsistent with a picture where these little decisions are happening locally, because you can rotate both polarizers together, and always the same thing happens. Either they both go through or they both get reflected. So this is the typical experiment that I just described. You have a source of entanglement. And in the previous experiment, they, all, they both kind of went in the same direction. But you can put little mirrors and have them go off, one off to the right and one off to the left. And then you decide independently how you orient this big cube, this big beam splitter. And remember that photons that are traveling, um, like photons that come out of the laptop that are waving horizontally, will always go through the beam splitter if it is also oriented horizontally. And photons that are traveling vertically, whose, whose uh, waves are waving in and out of the board, will always reflect. And as you rotate this thing, the probability changes. But like I said, as you rotate this thing, the, the two probabilities change together. So either, either you both get transmissions, or you both get reflections, as long as you rotate them together. And so um, let's ask about a few limiting cases here. So if the probability when the angles are the same, this is what I just talked about, is always one. The probability that you'll get the same result when the angles are identical is one. Perfect correlation. The probability when the angles are 90 degrees Part, when one is oriented like this and one is oriented turned by 90 degrees is zero. That also makes sense because uh, if there's a, say there's a pair of horizontal photons coming out, you rotate this by 90 degrees, by the time it hits the beam splitter, it, it acts like it's rotated by 90 degrees. So it does the opposite thing. Um, and when you rotate these things at 45 degrees, and they're 45 degrees orienting, uh, oriented with respect to each other. It's not the case that the same thing happens, or the opposite thing happens, somewhere in between. The results are totally uncorrelated. Sometimes you get OO, sometimes you get OX, sometimes you get XO, sometimes you get XX. It's totally uncorrelated. And so people like Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and other people who thought about this said, we have this model of photons carrying a polarization and hitting the beam splitter and making a last minute decision uh, is, is not right, but here's, here's something that is right, and I'm going to paraphrase something that they proposed. So what 
they called it a hidden variable. Other people have called this a hidden variable. So maybe, maybe a pair of photons is created from the source. And they both come with some, this kind of like pie chart thing, which is oriented at some angle. They're oriented at the same angle. Whatever is created, it's oriented at the same angle. And the way you ask, the way you uh, determine what happens in a given experiment is you plunk down your detectors at some angle. So say you oriented the detectors, you, you rotated this cube by 30 degrees from, from being horizontal, and you rotated the other cube by 30 degrees from being horizontal. You draw a line, 30 degrees, 30 degrees, and you ask, what happens? Well, here, here they both end up in the blue region, and so we can use this model to say, okay, well, we can predict that they both end up in the blue region, then they're both going to go through the, through the beam splitter, and this always happens together. And if you imagine orienting both detectors perpendicular to each other in this example, they'll, they'll both be in the red region, and we'll say they both reflect, either go through. And no matter how you orient the detectors, as long as you orient them together, you'll always get perfect correlation. Either they'll both be in blue regions or they'll both be in red regions. The same thing will happen on both sides. That's one way that you could explain perfect correlation, that photons just come with some, some little you know, virtual pie chart thing, and then when they hit the detector, they just check, OK, the detector angle is at this angle with respect to my pie chart. I'll look up what I'm supposed to do. I'll either go through or not go through. So that, that's a perfectly good explanation for the correlation. Also, well, this is what I just said, a little perfectly good explanation for the anti-correlation. And it's also a perfectly good explanation when you orient them 45 degrees off. You'll, you'll end up with uh, your detector in some region, say, blue, and then 45 degrees off, there's just a random 50-50 chance that this one will also end up in blue or also end up in red. And so it this sort of model seems to explain our our, uh, our our data for these special cases. And for a really long time, this is how people thought the world worked. That when you make pairs of entangled particles, either pairs of spins or pairs of photons, whatever is creating those pairs just creates a pair of things and gives them the same internal degree of freedom. It says, OK, these, these guys both have their, their blue uh, wedges up and down, and these photons both have their blue wedges at this angle, and these photons both have their blue wedges at this angle. And you, it explains a perfect correlation, it explains a perfect anti-correlation, it explains a perfect uncorrelation when, when you orient your detectors 45 degrees. And this model also perfectly explains a laptop photons. So when I, when I held my polarizer, uh, well, I guess this is opposite. When I held my polarizer uh, vertically, all laptop photons got, oh, all laptop photons went through, perfect. All laptop photons went through. And if you imagine vertical bars here, Every single one of these charts I drew, the vertical direction is in the blue region, so it's going to go through my polarizers. It's not going to reflect or do anything. Uh, it's not going to be absorbed. Uh, and you could still have a whole range of random orientations. And if you work out what happens if I hold my polarizer horizontally, they'll all get blocked because they'll all be in a red region. And if I or at some other angle, there'll be some probability. And so it seemed like this was a reasonable explanation. Now, this is not how quantum mechanics describes things. Quantum mechanics just says, here are just some rules for calculating probabilities. Go. It doesn't say what's really going on. It doesn't say that the photons carry some, some thing oriented in some direction. It doesn't explain how they would interact. But people sort of said, well, you know, maybe under the hood something's going on. We just haven't discovered what it is yet. We just need to, maybe if we did more measurements or came up with better models, uh, we could come up with some underlying mechanism that would give us all of the results from, all the probabilistic results from quantum mechanics, but be much more satisfying than just calculating probability. We would actually know what was happening. And so, um, to paraphrase these three here, they said the collapse of the wave function what you may have heard about quantum mechanics, you make a measurement and the whole wave function for the whole universe collapses, or at least the wave function for the system that you're working on collapses. Um, they argue that this was not, not, uh, not necessary in quantum mechanics. You could come up with perfectly good explanations that didn't require this. And, and for a long time, this is where it stood. For 30 years, this is where the situation stood. And then 
1964, this guy, John Bell, said, not so fast, actually. This, this works perfectly well for all the special cases you've considered, but it doesn't actually work for every possible measurement you can do. And what actually happens is much, much more exciting. And so let's, let's consider that. Here's my, my experiment again. I have a source of entangled particles. They go off in opposite directions. And now I'm going to plot the probability that the same thing happens. Probability that we get two O's or the probability that we get two X's. And if our detectors are oriented at the same angle, if delta theta is zero, both, if both polarizers are, are in the starting configuration. I haven't tilted them at all. And the probability that the same thing happens is one. And as I rotate them, the probability goes down. At 45 degrees, it's 50% totally uncorrelated. 90 degrees, it's totally anti-correlated. And if you actually work out what happens in that red, blue pie chart thing that I just kind of made up to, to match the data so far, it does match at the three limiting points. But in the middle, it doesn't match. You get a nice cosine squared curve again. And nobody thought much about this until, until 1964. But one of the Bell's great triumphs was he said, no, this, this isn't going to work. And it's not just a pie chart model that doesn't work. No matter how complicated you make these things, there is no model, no local model, that, that will do this. Um, something more has to be going on. Something different has to be going on. So let me give you, let me give you an example. So can some, some complicated local thing happen? No. Let me give you an example of, uh, of a way that we can use quantum mechanics and use this entanglement to do something that you can't do with any kind of um, any, any, uh, any model where things are only interacting locally or things have predetermined instructions. So, so if, you, if you've sort of gotten lost in all the quantum mechanics stuff, you can just focus again. This is kind of a logic puzzle now. I'm going to give you a logic puzzle that, that uh, we'll see how well we can do with this puzzle. And then I'll show you how well we can do if we add in quantum mechanics. Here's the puzzle. So imagine you go to a casino. This is a, a, a kind of a gambling game. And, and here's what happens. You're, there are two people who are playing. And let me, let me actually pick two people who, who will play this game. And I'll pick people from the front row because it's convenient. So you, you will play. Sorry, I'm volunteering you. And you will play. And you each walk into separate rooms far, far, far away from each other. But you can, you can strategize beforehand. I haven't told you what the game is yet, so <laughs> you can really good. And you'll each meet up with a, a casino employee who will take a coin. I uh, guarantee these are fair, fair quarters. Remember, you're in, you're in separate rooms far, far away. So once, after you strategize, you can't talk to each other. And here's what's going to happen. Uh, there you go, separate rooms. Each dealer is going to flip the quarter and show it to the, the player who has a little piece of paper, and then flip the corner, show the piece of the paper. Okay, so you can see your quarter, all right? But you're in separate rooms, so you can't see each other's quarters. And, and you have to write either an X or an O on this piece of paper. And here's, here's how you're going to win, all right? If the quarters came up like this, as long as there weren't two tails, then you win if you write the same thing on a piece of paper. So you could have strategized before. If they come up both tails, then you win if you wrote different things on a piece of paper. So this is the game. So let, I'll let you strategize. OK, so the two of you can talk and strategize about playing this game. And tell me what, what the best strategy is and, and how, you could, how often you could win this game if you, if you strategize. So I'll let you talk amongst yourselves. What's, what's the best you think you could do? And remember, the key is you can't see the other person's coin. You can only see your own coin. You have to write either an X or an X. You can ignore the quarter if you want. You can ignore the quarter if you want. Jason, can you clarify your finger a little bit? 
Is it the top three scenarios that win with the XX out loud? Yes. And the bottom, it's the only one that, the bottom scenario is the only one that wins with the XXL. Yes, I should have turned this thing around. Okay. Yes? And does XXL represent head and tails, or is it here? I mean, you can decide. As a player, you can choose to ignore the quarter if you want. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll call people back together. Let me, let me present it, the simplest strategy. Maybe you just both agree ahead of time to both write X and just totally ignore the quarter. How often would you win? 75% of the time. Does anyone have a strategy they can do better than that? Yes? Okay, so you're always going to write X, so we're always going to be in one of these two situations. And only if you see a tail will you write O. So you'll win here, you'll win here, you'll win here, but you'll lose here, right? Because you'll write X and he'll write O. So again, it comes out 75% of the time. Does anyone have a better strategy? Can anyone prove that there is no better strategy? <laughs> yes, someone said they would prove it. Well, because I've asked them to prove it a year ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so proving that there's no better strategy is equivalent to proving what Bell proved in 1964. Equivalent to proving Bell's inequality about uh, this, is, this is a form of Bell's inequality. So that the best strategy for this game is to win 75% of the time. So what's interesting is that if you were a pair of physicists, OK, so say the casino charges $180 uh, to play and gives you $100 for a win. So you would still, you wouldn't come out ahead of this. You would lose, you would lose a little bit of money on average every time. Right? But two physicists walk into the casino, and they're winning 85% of the time, which is above this limit. So, so how are they doing it? So one way that they could do it is they could use this property of entanglement. And this is not at all obvious. Now, proving, proving that the, the limit is 75% takes some work, but it's just sort of standard probability. Um, proving that this strategy works relies on either the experiment that I just said or uh, a little bit of pun. So here's, here's what they do. Uh, and the, these players in these games are always called Alice and Bob for, I don't know, historical cryptographic reasons or something. So the first player um, will, so they'll, they'll actually carry with them one of two entangled photons. And maybe this is difficult to do because photons move fast, but they can store their state in the state of an atom, say. Um, but uh, what one player will do is they'll measure this photon either with a detector oriented vertically or at 45 degrees. That will be what, what uh, what one player does, and the other player will orient their detector either at 22 and a half degrees or minus 22 and a half degrees, so that's half of 45. And they'll write down uh, zero if the photon passes through the detector, or they'll write down, or, sorry, O if it passes through the detector, or X if it's absorbed in detectors like this or reflected in one of those cube detectors. And if you just start with this curve I just drew, cosine squared, which didn't seem that exciting because there's a lot of cosine squared in physics. But now you can see why this is starting to become exciting. What is the angle difference between 0 and 22 and a half degrees? Well, it leads to a probability that they'll, get, they'll write the same thing, they'll get the same result, a probability of 85%. So in this case, 0 and minus 22 and a half, it's the same thing. The difference in angles is 22 and a half. 45 and 22 and a half, the difference in angles is again 22 and a half. So they'll end up writing the same thing on a piece of paper 85% of the time. And in the last case, this is the tricky case, 45 and minus 22 and a half. That difference is 67 and a half. It's halfway between 45 and 90. And the probability that they'll write the same thing is down here. The probability that they'll write opposite things 
is one minus that, it's up here, also 85%. So no matter what the quarters come up, as long as they're measuring entangled particles, somehow they're, they're winning 85% of the time. So uh, as long as all the detectors are perfect. So because of this, this other option that maybe, oh, so, so uh, what's happening with the photons themselves? Right? How are they doing it? How are the photons doing it? Well, it couldn't be that measurement of the photons is some local operation. And we just somewhat proved, if you're convinced that 75% is the limit, and no matter, how, no matter how the two people strategized and coordinated beforehand, they couldn't, they couldn't do better than 75%. We just proved that a local explanation can't explain this cosine squared curve either. So something else is happening. So, so here's the question: Is how are the photons doing it? And uh, and this this is where the set of experiments comes in. So there's a couple options. So let's imagine that the photons were cheating tomorrow. Let's imagine that the players were cheating. How how are ways that they could cheat? And the ways that we could do the experiment on the photons to prevent the photons from cheating. Right? I gave the players full power of the smartest people in Claremont. And they couldn't figure out how to do better than 75%. And yet the photons are doing it. So let's, let's figure out maybe the photons are sneaky and they're cheating. So here's a way that, that they could have cheated. Right? So say they had little radio transmitters or something, and they were in isolated rooms. But when one person saw the quarter, they radioed to their partner, hey, it's a heads. And then they could have had a strategy based on that, where once they know what the other quarter was, they could coordinate their, their writing a little bit better. That's one way of cheating. So, uh, how would we prevent that in tests of photons? Well, in tests of photons, since photons travel at the speed of light and nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, if we were to test our photons cheating in this way, we would send photons far away in opposite directions and only at the last instant reveal to them what angle the polarizer was going to be held at. And then, even if the photon saw that angle, they couldn't communicate back to the other photon what was happening. So that's one, one form of improving these experiments to prove that quantum entanglement really is something different and interesting. Um, imagine if they were allowed to quit. So imagine if they went into their rooms, they flipped the quarters, and if one of them saw tails, they're like, oh, you know what, I just want my money back, forget it. Then if you didn't count those games, on average they could win more often, right? Because you could always just quit in the case where you know you're likely to lose. And so how, what does that correspond to in, in experiments with photons, well, every detector is slightly inefficient. And so it could be that the photons were not detecting, because of the slight detector inefficiencies, were not detecting them because they somehow um, were, were pre-programmed to, to not be detected. So it's a little bit far-fetched, but you can stop this possibility by getting more and more efficient detectors. And over the last couple of years, there have been more and more efficient detectors. In the last way that people have thought about cheating is kind of the most subtle, and that's the one that I, I'm going to address with some of the, the quasars that I promised. So imagine if the players had bribed one of the, the casino employees to like not really flip the coin, but just you know let me know in advance what, what it's going to be. Or they were somehow able to influence the coin, or the coin wasn't quite fair. You weren't, you weren't quite able to, uh, to uh, it, it, you were able to predict what it was going to happen with. There you can imagine raising your chance of winning by a little bit. And maybe you can imagine raising your chance all the way up to 85, the quantum mechanical prediction. And so the, the big question that people were thinking about maybe between 10 and 5 years ago was, how do we make experiments that, that prevent this kind of cheating? So let me just quickly go through some of these experiments. 1972, this was the first experiment where they measured this at all, this entangled effect. In 1982, uh, this was the first experiment where they actually tried to change the settings while the photons were, were in flight. Uh, 1998 was the first time where they used random settings so that the photons couldn't, couldn't just say, oh, well, you know, it's been 10 minutes, this detector's been, been at this angle. I, I pretty much can guess that it's going to be at that angle and come up with a strategy that, that makes that work. Um, in 2012, uh, it, detectors were finally efficient enough to, to, uh, to perform this experiment and close that that loophole that involved cheating by just giving up. Uh, this is my friend Marissa Justina. She actually gave a colloquium at MUD maybe two years ago about this kind of work. 
Um, in 2015, she and some other people, uh, along with these other groups, were the first to really address this efficient business and the faster than light business at the same time. And recently, I would say the most exciting thing that happened about uh, a year or two ago was a Chinese group launched a satellite with a source of entangled photons on it. It could beam down to two different locations on Earth. So here's a picture of a satellite beaming things down to Earth, not, not that satellite. But with the two locations on Earth were, were far apart. So, so they beamed a pair of entangled photons between these two stations, and they beamed another other pairs of entangled photons between these two stations. And in both cases, even when the stations were pretty far apart, they were able to detect the fact that they were entangled. The photons were able to win this game more than 75% of the time. So this effect, quantum mechanics predicts that this effect has nothing to do with distance, and the photons uh, don't seem to be affected by, by longer and longer distances. There's sort of a whole series of these experiments that have been going on over the years. So if you were to ask people what, which of these three was likely the culprit, different people have different opinions, but this is from 1982. Uh, Richard Feynman has has a, a paper where he talks about entanglement. He does it in his own, his own way. He says, we have an illusion that we can do any experiment we want. We all, however, come from the same universe and evolved with it and don't really have any real freedom. Why? Because we obey certain laws and we have come from a certain past. And somehow that we are correlated with the experiments that we do. So what he meant by that was when the quarter flips or when, when the casino employee, if they're not flipping a fair quarter, if they're just deciding, just, just say heads, say tails. Um, either of those situations are things in the physical world, those must obey physical laws. Maybe, maybe the thing that's happening is the flipping mechanism of the quarter is somehow predictable by the pair of entangled photons, and they can use that predictability to, to, uh, to coordinate. And, and we all come from the same universe. We, we all share a, a past. Things could have influenced us. So my experiment, is to replace the random number generators that were used in all the experiments up until this point. So they've used the most sophisticated quantum random number generators, the best randomness ever. Uh, they've done as much as they could, but still those the, the, the quarter flips were happening in the same lab as everything else was happening. Or in the satellite experiment, they were happening on the ground stations. And the ground stations shared shared a path. So how many have seen these space-time diagrams of special relativity? All right, many people, good, good, not everyone. So distance is on the x-axis, time is on the y-axis. Um, something that's stationary, like a source of entangled particles, has an x-coordinate that doesn't change, but moves forward in time. Same thing with these measurement stations. They have some x-coordinate that doesn't change, but they move forward in time. And light. Uh, these diagrams travels at 45 degrees. It travels one year, one light year per year, or one light nanosecond per nanosecond. How big is a light nanosecond? Yeah, about that big. So, um, if you trace back the paths of all of these devices, the source of entanglement, the thing that's flipping the coins in these experiments, the detectors that's detecting the photons, they all share a common path only four milliseconds before each experiment. And so we don't know what it could be, but there's plenty of time for information from this shared region to coordinate the, the flippings and coordinate the entanglement. And yes, this is admittedly far-fetched, but quantum mechanics is so weird, and applications of quantum mechanics and quantum computing and quantum cryptography are becoming so important to our economy, it would be good to really test this as best as we possibly can. So. The idea that I was working with was, I said, well, what if instead of using some local source of randomness, if we use light from distant quasars? And if we look at the special relativity space-time diagram for that, we can find quasars that are really, really uh, far away. They emitted there like really, really long ago. And if you trace back the, um, the light cone from these quasars, if you find quasars that are far enough away, it turns out that those light cones don't even overlap at the time of the Big Bang. So this is a little surprising because we think that at the Big Bang everything was kind of all on top of each other and it was a hot soup and everything was mixing. But the universe was expanding so quickly that even at the speed of light, 
even though everything was a very small distance from each other. The universe was expanding so quickly that uh, information couldn't be exchanged uh, instantaneously. And there are quasars that are far enough away where if we trace back their, their history, uh, their, their pasts don't overlap. So this was my, what got me excited. So well, we can find real quasars in the sky that, that obey this. So let me, let me skip a few slides um, because I'm going to be short on time if I go through everything. Let me run right to the actual implementation of this experiment. So you could pull up a list of, you can calculate how far back we need to go. So the distance that we measure quasars in is, is redshift. It's how many times the universe, basically, how many times the universe has expanded uh, by, what, by what factor the universe has expanded between the time that the quasars emitted their light and now. And you can calculate the threshold. If the, the quasars are far enough away from each other, if they're, the universe has expanded by, by uh, a factor corresponding to redshift of 3.7 or so, then and you find a pair of them on opposite sides of the sky, then those quasars haven't been able to share a past. And you can use them as a source of unpredictable randomness, uninfluenceable randomness. Nothing from the past of the Earth could have influenced them, and nothing from their past could have influenced each other. And in the database of quasars, there, this is the flux in photons. So this is an astronomical observing band, basically visible plus infrared. The flux of photons for quasars that are far enough away, there's still a few that have at least 10,000 photons per second coming at us. And so that's bright enough to, to do an experiment with sufficiently large telescopes. So that's, that was the experiment that I did, and that's what I'll, I'll talk about here. So, so what are quasars? Quasars are, are these nuclei of galaxies that are really, really far away. They emit an enormous amount of light, 100 times brighter than galaxies like ours. How are they doing that? Well, their, their gravitational pull is consuming mass, and it is turning that mass into light. So E equals mc squared. It's consuming 10 to 1,000 solar masses worth of material every year. It corresponds, if you're keeping track, to 600 Earths per second. It's a lot of E for mc squared to equal. And, and that means that these are putting on a lot of light. These are old, old galaxies that are, uh, sorry, they're, they're, they emitted their light long ago. So the light is very old. The galaxies were very young when this was happening. They were still forming. These were still, still, um, still uh, gravitating into the black hole around the center. So we think that all this light comes from a region that's pretty small. It's coming from, from the black hole that seeded many of these galaxies. This is great. This is the brightest source of continuous light in the universe at, at these distances. So there are other bursts of light. But we can't predict those. We can't really use them in an experiment. So we need a, we need a source that's, that's continuous and is going to shine uh, quite at least for us to set up. So, so how, how do we use quasars to do this? Well, there are two ideas. One is to measure the arrival time of photons coming in and say, well, so, so one, person, one telescope is looking off in this direction, one telescope is looking off in that direction, light's coming in, and you can record, did, did the next photon arrive on an even or an odd nanosecond? And that works, but people have quibbled with, with uh, well, you know, the atmosphere delays things by a little bit, there's some problems there. We ended up settling on this. We, we, had a cutoff of uh, most is basically between visible light and infrared light, and we said if, if the photon arrives that's a little bit redder than average, we'll orient the, the beam splitter at a certain angle, and if the next photon that arrives from the quasar is a little bit bluer than average, we'll orient the beam splitter at a different angle. So, uh, so this corresponds to something like this. Here's a picture. Imagine instead of the Instead of flipping quarters, people flip these little tokens with red and blue sides. And the orientation of each polarizer, each polarizing beam splitter, was set by whether the next quasar photon coming in was a little bit redder or a little bit bluer than average. And be two settings, either 90 or zero. Well, this, this person has 0 and 45, red or blue. And this person has, I think it's 22 and a half or minus 22 and a half. Again, only two. So there's four angles we have to worry about, but each person only worries about two. And by person, I mean some automated equipment that can work incredibly fast. Because all this has to happen 
this uh, quasar photon has to come in, its color has to be measured, and this thing has to be rotated. Usually we don't rotate it physically, we rotate, we rotate it electrically. All that has to happen before information about this can get to the other side of the experiment. These experiments are big, they're kilometers big, and still things have to happen within a few nanoseconds. So all this has to happen very quickly. So I'll show you some pictures of, of how this works in a, in a little bit. Um, so at Harvey Mudd, we built a device that does this. Light comes in, most of the light goes into a camera so we can see where we're looking. Some of the light goes through a tiny hole in this mirror, and that light gets split by a, by a mirror, a dichroic mirror. There's a dichroic mirror in the projector. Dichroic mirror that, uh, that splits off the bluish light from the reddish light. And we have these uh, single photon detectors that can detect individual photons, and they would output a signal. Either this one would output a little signal, the blue photon came in, or this one would output a little signal with the, the reddish photon came in. And here's what that device looks like. Uh, we uh, spent the summer buying all the optics and machining the parts right up the street. Some students and I went to install it at a telescope at Table Mountain, which Pomona also has. Uh, telescope there. This was not, not the telescope that the phone used, but one right next to it, basically. So Calvin and Amy came with me. Uh, this is a telescope we used. It's a uh, one meter diameter telescope, just like the Pomona telescope. Here's Amy installing the, uh, she's actually removing the previous detector. And here's the detector installed on the telescope. And we took a bunch of data. This is Calvin adjusting things uh, on the telescope. This is the telescope looking at the Milky Way. The gratuitous astronomy pictures here. Uh, this is a telescope looking at Saturn, so you can tell it's Saturn because of the rings. And this giant hole in the center of Saturn is the pinhole that we that we uh, we would move this telescope around in the sky so that the quasar we were interested in was went right into this pinhole, and all the other stuff around it would reflect into this camera that we're looking at, so we could tell where we're pointing. So here's a picture from that. You can see where we're pointing at the, at this this quasar. If we move the telescope just a little bit, this quasar would disappear into that pinhole. Uh, we calibrated it on the, the crab, crab pulsar. There's a really bright uh, dead star that flashes about 100 times, well, uh, yeah, 100 times a second. So here's a little movie from, from a telescope. There's two fixed stars and this pulsar here in the middle of the crab nebula, kind of a boom, 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 boom. There's like kind of a bright flash and a dim flash. And we could point our instrument at that spot in the sky and detect, and here's us pointing the instrument at that spot in the sky. We detect that, we detect that and count all the photons from it. So we use this to calibrate all of our detectors and calibrate our timing down to sub nanosecond level. And, and then we brought this device and devices like it to the Canary Islands. So Canary Islands are off the coast of Africa. Um, there's a lot of astronomy telescopes there. And I'll show you some pictures of a few of them. And it's one of the few places in the world where there are telescopes that are far enough apart to do an interesting version of this experiment, but close enough that uh, we could coordinate. So here's a picture, here's a panorama I took. We had a transmitter that was not actually in this telescope, it was in this little shipping crate here, and it would create entangled photons in the shipping crate and beam one of the two over this valley to this telescope, which is uh, I don't know, it's the next generation telescope, but it's in Italian. And even though my name's Italian, I'm not sure I can pronounce it properly. Um, and it would beam the other one of these entangled photons over this valley to the William Herschel telescope, which is a British telescope. And, and amazingly, we got the Italians and the British to both work with us together at the same time. And we got observing time, these two hour blocks simultaneously. And uh, here's a schematic, a little shipping crate, tilted a little bit in this drawing, I don't know why we do the cartoon tilted, but sending entangled photons in opposite directions through these transmitting telescopes, um, receiving the entangled photons at the base of each of the big telescopes, and they're going to be measured either at zero degrees or 45 degrees, or on this side they're going to be measured at minus 22 and plus 22. And this choice of which, which angle they're going to be measured at is controlled by one of these detectors that I'm going to show you that we built that lot. Light comes into the enormous four meter telescope and it's focused through the pinhole onto one of these detectors and either it's, it's red or it's blue. Either we select the red basis where we can tell whether the photon was 
uh, in this direction, that direction, or the blue base, you can tell what that direction is. We did a version of this, of this experiment. So part of what my students did, and, and Nora's here, and she helped me with this, was pick, of all the possible quasars in the sky, which pair should we use? And this really depended on a whole lot of factors, where they were in the sky, how bright they were, how far away they were, um, where they were during our two hours that we were allotted. And so we searched a database of a million quasars and made a trillion pairs of quasars by optimizing that we had to consider fewer. But during our two hour observation time, this is kind of a plot looking down from a, a view that doesn't exist. If you looked straight up and saw a star, it would appear right here. So this quasar appeared a little bit to the north northeast, uh, off you know, 60 degrees above the horizon. Uh, and this quasar over the two hours would move, and this other quasar over the two hours would move, and all the telescopes had to track. And, uh, and we determined what was the best pair of quasars to use. Here are, here they are. I'm not going to dwell on this too long. They're just sort of two, two regular random quasars, at least this one is. This one's got a gravitational lens in front of it, um, which is pretty, the lens itself is pretty far away, um, but it's brighter than it otherwise would have been. These are at redshift of almost one. That was when the universe was half as big as it is today. This was at redshift almost four. That was when the universe was almost a fifth its current size. That's, that's when light from these quasars was emitted. Um, we can trace back the light from from those quasars and see when they overlap. We weren't quite able to get quasars that had no overlap, but if you actually take into account the expanding universe, the fact that the whole universe was smaller and smaller and smaller in the past, if you really calculate what volume of the entire past of our space-time could possibly have influenced the light that was emitted from this quasar, and what volume of the universe's entire past could have influenced this light. And for this pair, even though uh, it doesn't look like it on this, on this projection, the total volume that could have influenced the choices in our experiment was only 4% of the, the universe's past. So we're able to close the door on 96% of the possible uh, causal influences. So, uh, yeah, so I just said 4%. Next, uh, I'm repeating that slide. So let me just show you a few more pictures. This is the source of entanglement. This is a little bit more sophisticated than the one that we have at the Harvey Mudd Lab, a little bit more sophisticated than the one that we're going to call up Florida. But this is still Calvin. He was my research student. After, after he graduated from Mudd, he went off to Vienna to work on this experiment with, with people there. Um, it generates approximately 100,000 or a million entangled photons per second that are really nice, high quality. This was one of the transmitting telescopes that transmitted one of the entangled photons far away. Here it's transmitting it right to this guy, but when he's out of the way, it goes all the way to the telescope. Yes? It's a free space transmission. Free space transmission, yeah. So it's free space, uh, about a kilometer in each direction. Um, this is the free space receiver. So this received the entangled photons and um, focused them into, uh, into this device, which does the um, incredibly fast rotation. And here's the other receiver, although you can't see it because the, the black thing is there to prevent the sun from, from burning. And this poor guy had to stand in this box for many hours at night making sure that things were working, all the experiment going. You can see that it requires a lot of people because we had a lot of different stations and everything had to, had to be coordinated. So, so this worked. And this is me taking a selfie in front of one of the telescopes in Triumph. And this is the sun coming up. You can see why they do experiments on the Canary Islands, because all the city, city stuff is, is, uh, is below the cloud layer, and the mountains are above the cloud layer. And uh, yes, so, so triumphantly, this works. So here, here are some results. Let me present the table. So when, when both detectors, when both quasar detectors uh, received a blue photon, how many times did both entangled photon detectors record zeros on their electronic pieces of paper. Well, it happened 956 times. And then there was, how many times did they both record X? That many times. Clearly, they both recorded the same thing more than they recorded different things. Same thing with when, when the quasar photons were this color and that color, and they were both 
red and they were both tails in our, in our little quarter game, now the opposite happened. They, were, they gave opposite results most of the time. Oh, so there's my analogy with the, the quarters. Well, we can actually calculate the, the percent of time that, that these entangled photons won the game, even, even when they couldn't predict what was coming in, because it was coming in from quasars. So in this situation, they won the game 83% of the time, and here they won it 80% of the, all of these are above 75%. If you average it, uh, the probability that this entangled pair won was 83. So it wasn't quite 85. It, it, there were still some imperfections. But it was significantly more than the 75% limit that you all convinced me was, was, uh, was the end, was the limit. So um, yeah, we used, we used settings from quasars that could not have been affected by 96% of the observable universe. And the photon still won this, won this game 83% of the time. Now, there was a, a little caveat here that I have to mention. When, when we point our red-blue detectors slightly away from the quasars, we don't get zero photons in. There's still some local photons coming from the fact that that city was there. There was some glow in the sky. There's always the detectors sometimes just go off because no detector is perfect. Well, we can take that into account. We can point the detectors away from the quasars and measure how many photons are coming in. And we say, well, if we, if we do that for, for 10 minutes and we get about 100 photons, now let's go back to our real data and say, well, we'll let 100, 100 of those photons just automatically win the game. We'll, we'll allow them to cheat as much as they want. And even when we allow the local atmospheric photons to cheat, we still get a very significant result. So, the probability that the best strategy that any of you could come up with would win the game as often as, as we measured the entangled photons to win the game uh, was really tiny, because we had a lot of measurements. So for your experimental physicist, this corresponds to something like a nine over nine sigma result. So we're pretty sure that random statistical fluctuations weren't, the, weren't what's going on here. And, uh, and this led to a paper recently, and there's a lot of people here who were involved, and some of my students here. Calvin was a student that might have just graduated. Uh, Nora Bailey was here in the audience. She helped me pick out a pair of quasars. So it was a, a, a really fun thing to do. So for the last minute, let me just talk about a little bit about what we're doing at MUD. So we are building our own source of entanglement, yes. Um, we're building our own one of these like super efficient, high, high output, really pure sources of entanglement. Um, we are, oh, here's a diagram of We've got a UV laser that goes through some polarization optics. And there's an interferometer here where the UV light can either go this way or that way through a crystal. And that creates a pair of infrared photons that, that we capture and put into these fiber optics and then into these detectors where we can really run this experiment ourselves. Um, we're going to build transmitters and, and receivers for all these things. And we can use it to do other things. We can use it to improve tests of wave-particle duality. There's a famous experiment where you can choose whether to put in a beam splitter or not while, while a photon has, is already in this interferometer. And we can uh, improve the tests like that by using this red-blue generator to, to be the deciding factor. And you can remove some, some models for how that works. So here's there's some students from the summer, some of whom are here. Thank you very much. This is great. This is a schematic of another device we're building. And uh, I just want to thank you all for your attention. And I hope you got something out of this and got excited about quantum entanglement, that it's not, not just some random statistical stuff, but it's really powerful. I, I showed how you can use it to win this game that the smartest people in Claremont could not, uh, could not figure out how to win. Uh, now, granted, that's maybe not a game that you're super interested in playing, but more sophisticated versions of that game are what make quantum computers so interesting and quantum cryptography so powerful. So thank you very much. So, questions for Jason? No? No, no, you students first. Uh, so is that a model or is it just based on statistical? Activity? It is both. So quantum mechanics, um, 
if, if you probably in your second quantum mechanics class, at least that might be, be show how quantum mechanics predicts exactly that. And uh, by measuring it, you can just take your two polarizers and flip them at slightly different degrees and record what the probability that you'll either get the same answer or different answers. Which one came first? Which one came first? Historically, the prediction came first by, by a lot. So the first experiment was in 1970-something. I think the prediction was they probably could have done it in the 30s, but maybe they didn't actually do it until the 50s. So could you explain how they came up with that theory? Um, no, but I would say that it is part of the standard, standard quantum mechanics. So the, the quantum mechanics of the 20s and 30s could, could predict that without, without any problems. It's just that quantum mechanics doesn't tell you what's going on under the hood. Quantum mechanics just tells you the probability of this happening is cosine squared of the difference of the angles. It doesn't tell you whether that's because things are happening locally or something else is happening. And, and there's no real reason why somebody couldn't have noticed that you could do interesting things with it until the 60s. And between the 30s and the 60s, it, plenty of people probably knew about this cosine squared thing. And nobody, nobody looked at it in the right way to say, ah, you know, it's, there's some subtle thing here that you can perform tasks that you couldn't perform without these entangled photons. Uh, sorry, yes? Why was it not possible to get two, um, two quasars that have absolutely no um, The limiting factor was actually this, this thing I said at the end about the photons from the atmosphere. We want to allow them, if, so say, say in our experiment, we, in our 10 minutes of running, we get 1,000 photons from the atmosphere. So we want to be able to say in our data, Yes, you won 83% of the time, but we're gonna we're gonna say that a thousand of those runs were automatic wins because you maybe you were using atmospheric photons, you weren't really using quasar photons. So what we need to do is we need to find quasars that were bright enough that the vast majority of runs of this experiment came from light that was really from the quasars and not from the detectors themselves or from glow in the atmosphere. And that limited how dim the quasars were, and with the telescopes we had and the amount of observing time we had and the uh, brightness on the days we were operating, the best we could do was, was push back almost to where things didn't quite overlap. Uh, but it would be hard. It would be hard to, to go all the way. I think we would need telescopes that were, so these were four meter telescopes. They're you know, sort of the second best class of telescopes in the world. We probably need to go to the best class of telescopes in the world. And we would need two of them that were a couple kilometers apart. And uh, that may happen one day, but give us a lot of money and I'll make it happen. Dwight? So how do you rule out that there could have been some kind of cons conspiracy pre inflation through the port of the plasma or something like that? We can't. Okay. So um, the good news is that one of the people who was on this paper, were some people who have expertise in inflation, Alan Booth and Dave Kaiser at MIT. So they, they helped us kind of formulate the arguments for, yes, this, we can never completely rule this out, but inflation was a very different time. There were no particles. There were no, the quarks and gluons hadn't even been created yet. Uh, there were no photons. All there was was this special kind of energy density that was causing the universe to expand exponentially. It was only after that stopped that that energy density got converted into photons and quarks of gluons and everything else. So, so we can never really rule it out. All we can do is place limits on, on uh, how far, how, how much of the post-inflationary universe we can exclude. So that, yeah, that's something we, we worked out yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I wanted to ask a question. So um, if I understand you correctly, what you did in the beginning was you have some light that goes through your system, right? And then you produce two, two photons that are infrared, is that correct? Yes. Okay. And then those two particles are the entangled particles that you, that play the game, right? Yes. 
So then in this case, when we're when, when you're talking about using the quasars, these are two separate quasars, right? So are you saying that you're assuming that the light that you're getting from quasar X and Y are tangle particles, or are you looking at, let's say, the light from quasar X goes through your system, producing two entangled, but I don't know, like, mm. can you clarify that? Yeah, so that's a good point. I, I should have maybe spent a little bit more time here. So this, the detector on this telescope just turns this light into an electrical signal. Okay. That electrical signal controls electrically, so very quickly, it doesn't actually rotate anything, but it has the same effect as rotating the cube here, rotating the, the detector, rotating the sunglasses. So there are really four photons, for every, every one of those, every one of these numbers here, there were four photons that all basically came in all at the same time. There were two infrared photons that are entangled with each other, and one photon from this quasar, and one photon from that quasar. And the quasar photons came in just early enough to be able to rotate this to an angle while these two were in flight. And, and then the angle got set, and it was fixed, and then these continue their kilometer-long flight, and then boom, they're measured at a certain angle. Okay, so th 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 if I'm understanding correctly, so the light from the quasars are polarized, right? Uh, y yes, but we're not measuring the polarization of the quasars. Oh, okay, we're so just measuring the color. But does the polarization of the quasars affect the, the angle at which the, the detectors are rotated? No, only the color does. So, okay. so the detectors at the end of this telescope, there's, there's sort of a gap here. The photons never go from here to here. Just the electrical signals. The detectors here are only sensitive to color. They don't know or, or care about the polarization of the photons. And the reason why we did that was because color, color of the photons corresponds to their energy. And there's no reason to think that anything along the way could have affected their energy. So certainly all the energies get spread out because the universe is expanded. But a photon that was a little bit bluer than average when it was emitted, it's still going to be a little bit bluer than average when it's detected. There's not a lot in the way that can take individual photons and shift them up or down in energy like that. But that, that, is, a, that is a concern. And that's, that's why we didn't measure the polarization, for example, the quasar photons, because a lot can, can change that. Jerry? Um, let me show you what our criteria was. I think I would have that in a backup slide. It, the, the criteria was basically we, we knew the spectrum of the quasars. And, uh, oh, hold on, show slide. And that. So we knew the spectrum of the quasars. Here are three, three different quasars that we used. And we, we chose our mirrors. So that roughly, roughly half of the light from the quasar made it into the, the bluish channel, and half of it made it into this reddish channel. We had a gap in the middle, so that no light, there was no light that we were really unsure about. And that gap happened to correspond to a bright peak where the sky emits a lot of, a lot of light. So that helped us get rid of a little bit of the light that came from the sky. Uh, and so all the light from here, plus all the light from there amounted to you know, some small fraction of the total light that came in from, from the quasars. So that's, that's how we chose our, our band, was just to try to split roughly down the middle. And in the game that I presented here, um, it mattered that the, the quarters were really 50-50. There's a more sophisticated version of this limit where it doesn't actually matter if the quarters are perfectly 50-50 or not. For whatever ratio the quarters are, you can say, you can come up with a limit for how often you win and we exceeded that limit. So it's not exactly 50-50, but it doesn't matter. It's just the farther you are from 50-50, the more data you have to take, you can still, still make a significant statement. Uh, um, OK, so if I'm understanding correctly, the wave that we normally have would estimate that it would beat the game 85% of the time. And with the different randomization, there's still that difference. There's so still the like one point whatever, one and a half percent between eighty-three point whatever you got. Right. Uh, sorry, and eighty-five percent. So how do you account for that difference? Like is, do you think that the randomization 
is somehow affecting their ability to predict the dealer? Um, how uh, why is it not congruous with the normal time? Like that? That's a good question, but I, I would say that almost any sneeze you make near the instrument can reduce this number. Okay. So everything has to be perfectly aligned to get this number as high as possible. Yeah. You can always screw things up a little bit. Um, we're generating entangled particles, but I've sort of, you know, so I've made it seem a lot easier than it actually is. You shoot a laser in and two entangled particles come out. Unless things are perfectly aligned and perfectly balanced, those particles aren't going to be purely entangled. They're going to they're going to be a little bit. They're going to yeah. They're going to act a little bit unentangled, a little bit classical. So it's really easy to get this number lower. It's impossible even quantum mechanics to get it higher. But the more fine tuned you make everything, the closer to eighty five percent. Let's say the gap here is just. We tried as hard as we could to make this thing work, but you know, they were in a shipping container. Yeah. Is there any, sorry to follow up, but like, is there any um, really similar experiment that's been done to yours that, has, that like, you could compare this number to? Um, so many... Uh, with a normal number generator, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So let me, let me go back to that. The, this whole series of experiments, um, this one, right? <laughs> So this whole series of experiments has been a history of improving these sources to get closer and closer and closer to ideal. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd say particularly these, these set of experiments that happened in 20, 2015 really had probably the purest sources of entanglement that anyone has measured. And they, and they had them far apart so that things happened faster than the light could communicate. And they had these super efficient detectors. And so I think that the purity here so usually, uh, purity is usually measured from like zero to hundred percent, rather than from zero to eighty-five percent wins. But the purity here was ninety. Some of these got ninety-nine something percent, so it corresponds to like eighty-four point five percent wins. And and these sources are are getting quite good. The the one in the satellite, you know, is not that amazing because it's in a satellite and it got bounced around a lot and stuff. But it's still good enough to break this limit. Uh, Phil. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> what, what, what was the wind rate for the sky in the background for this contamination? Space? Identical. Identical. So, so first of all, we, a case by case, we don't know. While we're taking the data from the quasar, we don't know whether a particular photon came from the quasar from the sky. So we can't separate that. But what we did was after we took the, the data with the quasars, we moved both telescopes to a dark patch of sky near them and took data for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing was different. And quantum mechanics would predict that nothing's different because quantum mechanics doesn't care where the randomness comes from. It's only these sort of models of what people are sort of trying to underlying explanations for why those probabilities are what they are that, that might make a difference. So, so the it didn't make a difference. Recently random enough. So what would have been the really exciting result? Like what would you have liked to have seen that would have just been ah, yes. not what? just a test, but wow, you've discovered would it be seventy five percent or what what is the thing that might have really changed the way you think about this. I would say that my the thing that I would love to have seen was we would have taken a whole series of measurements from local random number generators in our lab to planets to stars to galaxies nearby to quasars and the amount of violation of this limit would have would have gone from the 85% that quantum mechanics predicts down 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 to you know, maybe 75% or, you know, even further down. Just some, some distance dependence. And then there would be a new interesting thing that might happen. And you know, we could have a new constant that, that somehow reflects the side of the universe. And you know, one, one motivation for going to quasars and to going to things that are this far away is there's sort of a significant fraction of a, a Hubble distance away from us. So if somehow this, this uh, decrease would have been correlated with distance, we were just to pick a distance out of out of thin air, you might have said, well, maybe it has something to do with cosmology and causal pasts, and maybe therefore with the expansion, kind of characteristic distance of the universe, characteristic expansion distance. And we, you know, we, we didn't, we haven't done enough to really pin it down, but it seems like it doesn't affect it at all, so it's not clear how, how much more it's worth pursuing. Okay, last question, David. Uh, so I'm sorry, just the experimentalist, me, in particular in response to your response to Phil, about pointing at the dark sky, 
what is the frequency of photon counts coming from your entangled source? What's the frequency of photon counts coming from each of your quasars? In other words, when you point at dark sky, how would you have enough input from to flip your things for each entangled photon that came in? So uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just so. So right, in order to even have a run of the experiment, you need four things all happen That's right. all at the same and time. That's right. dark sky, I would think you would have a large number of times you didn't get any counts at all. Y yes, that, that's correct. And so you need to point a dark sky for an hour to get enough data to say something statistically significant. Uh, but the entangled photon source generates about a million entangled pairs per second. A quarter of those actually make it through those free space telescopes, which is higher than I would have guessed. A quarter of those go through the fiber optics, it goes through the transmitting telescopes, it goes through that, that lens that was about this big, and, and actually get detected, um, or at least get into the detectors. And, um, and so, so we have an entangled photon rate of you know, maybe 100,000 per second. And the quasars with these big telescopes, we're also getting 10 to 100,000 photons per second. And the dark sky was about 1,000 1, to 2,000 photons per second. So. Every second or a few times a second, we would get a situation where all four came in within the necessary time window. This is why the experiment has to be really big, because the bigger the experiment, the longer that time window is that we can receive quasar photons, turn them into a setting, and the, and the entangled photons are already out on their way. So the bigger we make the experiment, the better things become. Well, we'll be going to uh, dinner afterwards, and of course, we could ask also questions uh, right now if you want to come up. So uh, let's thank Jason again for a great time. Thank you for having me.